morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out. My name is Jessica Guzik, and I'm the chair of the Moot Court Executive Board. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the final round of the 2010 mock trial competition. At this time, I would just like to remind you to please turn off or silence yourself. In this year's mock trial competition, the state of Glenfest seeks to convict Vic Porter for violating a cyberbullying statute. Representing the state of Glenfest are finalists Christy Montroy and Matt Baker. Representing Vic Porter are Tiffany Caterina and Jennifer Smirnos. The finalists have distinguished themselves in a field of over 80 competitors. We have no doubt that you'll be as impressed by their talent and their poise as we were in the report their performances tonight. Tonight's case will be heard by a jury and presided over by three judges. The mock trial administrators, Bill Larson and Claire Morneau, will now introduce the judges and brief the case you are about to hear. Thank you. Well, I have the, uh, the honor to introduce our judges to you tonight, and we have three uh, distinguished alumni who are helping us out tonight. We have the Honorable Pamela J. White. She was appointed to the Circuit Court for Baltimore City and took office February 8, 2007. She then stood for election and was elected on November 4, 2008. Judge White has served on the criminal docket, the civil docket, and in the family division. She's the judge responsible for court-administered ADR programs and is a member of the ADR committee for the, uh, the conference of circuit judges. Judge White graduated from Mary Washington College with a BA in 1974 and from WNL Law in 1977. As an alumna, she was elected to the Order of the Order of the Coif and Omicron Delta Kappa as well as Phi Beta Kappa. Judge White currently serves on the Board of Visitors at the University of Mary Washington, and she's a board member emeritus of the Washington Lee Board. Judge White was actually WNL's first alumna to serve on the Board of Trustees. Judge White practiced civil law for 30 years with the law firm of Ober, Taylor, Grimes, and Schreiber in Maryland, as well as in Washington, D.C., and New York. While in private practice, she engaged in general civil litigation with an emphasis on employment litigation. Judge White is a past president of the Maryland State Bar Association and a former chair of the Professionalism Committee. She's also the former president of the Women's Bar Association of Maryland and has served on the Maryland Board of Law Examiners from 1986 through 1994. Judge White also uh, was one of the founding members of Dean's Cup here at WNL. <laughs> And she made the transition from Tucker Hall over to uh, Lewis Hall here, and still has her cup from uh, when the building was dedicated. Judge Parkins was appointed to the Superior Court of Delaware by Governor Ruth Ann Minner and confirmed by the Senate in 2008. He hold, holds an undergraduate degree in mathematics from the University of Delaware and earned his law degree with honors in 1972 from WNL. He was also editor, uh, an editor of Law Review. After graduating from law school, Judge Parkins clerked for Chief Justice uh, Wolcott and Herman on the Delaware Supreme Court. And after a short time at a small firm, he went into the Delaware Department of Justice as a trial attorney and quickly rose through the ranks to become chief of the department's appellate division. In 1982, he joined the law firm of Richards, Leighton, and Finger. Uh, the largest law firm in Delaware, and he focused on commercial litigation. While in private practice, the Delaware Supreme Court, Sue Esponte appointed him to serve as amicus curiae on several matters. Judge Parkins is known for his advocacy skills, has often been asked to write and speak uh, on advocacy. He has written in two appellate practice manuals and for the Delaware Law Review, among other uh, publications. He's lectured at the behest of the United States Court of Appeals and the Delaware Supreme Court on effective brief writing and oral arguments. He's also an adjunct professor at Widener Law School. Judge Parkins is a string of four generations of WNL graduates. Uh, his grandfather graduated from the law school, his father from the undergrad, and two of his daughters from the undergrad. Judge Parkins also uh, was a member of the Saturday morning football league. Um, I think maybe we advanced it by going right afternoon. And uh, Judge Parkins.
park ends once while homesick. His dog actually attended class for him in Tucker Hall and he sat in his seat. He did not know that was happening at the time. Uh, the Honorable Joseph R. Slights is going to preside over tonight's trial. He was appointed to the Superior Court of Delaware by Governor Tom Carper on November 2nd in 2000. He presides over the court's Seroquel litigation docket and is a member of the court's complex commercial litigation division, and that's for expedited commercial litigations with over a million dollars at issue. Judge Slights received his Bachelor's of Science in Political Science from James Madison University in 1985 and his Juris Doctorate from right there in 1988. Uh, he also found love at WNL, and he found it on the LSFL field. Uh, his teammate, Alan, later became his wife. She was a, a class behind him and a star on the football field. <laughs> Prior to joining the Superior Court, Judge Slice was an associate in private practice at Richard Slayton & Finger, uh, where he practiced mostly corporate litigation. And then he went on to become associate of the law office of Sidney Bollock, where he practiced personal injury, commercial litigation, white collar criminal defense. And then from 1992 to 2000, he was a partner with the law firm of Morris, James, Hitchens, and Williams, where he practiced in the area of health law, corporate and commercial litigation, and white-collar white -collar crime defense. He was vice chairman of the health law practice group um, and chairman of the firm's recruiting committee. Judge Slips has been elected to serve on the American Law Institute. He's a past chairman of the health law section and currently serves as the judicial member of the Executive Committee of the Delaware Bar Association. He's also a past president of the Rodney Innit Court and is a charter member of the American College of Business Court Judges. Uh, he also works at Georgetown University uh, with their eDiscovery Institute. Uh, he's a recipient of the Delaware State Bar Association's Distinguished Mentoring uh, Award and the Middle States Council of Social Studies Distinguished Service Award in recognition of his long dedication to the Delaware High School mock trial competition. And many of you uh, might be interested to know that uh, he has a proclivity for hiring WNL students as the sparks. <laughs> um, we have this distinguished panel of judges, and I'd ask you to help me welcome them. started with 81 participants, which has been whittled down to the four individuals that you see in front of you right now. The competition, which is open to second and third year students, requires participants to compete in teams of two and to perform free trial motions, opening statements, direct and cross-examinations, and closing statements. The first two rounds of the competition were judged by Bill and myself with help from other Moot Court Executive Board members. Um, the the semifinal round was judged by two professors here at Washington and Lee. The case that you're going to see tried today, the State of Lundfest versus Vic Quarter, was written by myself and Bill. In that case, Vic Quarter, an 18-year-old senior at Midlands High School, has been charged with a Class D felony under the State of Lundfest cyberbullying statute. On October 1, 2009, Quarter created a group on the popular social networking site Bookface. The group invited members to post derogatory comments about another Midland student, 15-year-old Bobby Dean. Porter personally extended invitations to all of Porter's friends at Midlands High School. After this, Dean experienced harassing behavior at school. Students attempted to capture photographs of Dean in unflattering positions, including changing for gym class or crying. On October 20th, 2009, a group of students followed Dean home from school, taunting Dean. As a result, when Dean arrived home, Dean attempted to commit suicide. On October 20th, acting under a tip from the student, Porter was brought into Principal Morrison's office, where Porter's cell phone was confiscated. Principal Morrison called Officer Benny Keatley to the high school to investigate, and Officer Keatley ended up arresting Vic Porter. On November 4, 2009, the grand jury returned an indictment 
for Porter on a felony harassment charge. Uh, this time, when the judges are going to return to their chambers, and we'll take the jury back, and we will get the trial underway.
tend to uh, give the appearance of, un of them being untrustworthy. Uh, and also, we believe they're prepared not as a regularly conducted uh, business record, rather in anticipation for litigation. And particularly, we're concerned about the fact that all the uh, all the email addresses have been substituted with names of the actual people that the email came from, who think shows tampering with the evidence, and we request that uh, it be excluded as hearsay. All right. Have you presented those to the court? Uh, Your Honor, we'd be glad to do so at this time. Commissioner Bridge. You may. Could have appearances, please, on behalf of the defendant, and then we can address any pretrial matters you have, and then we'll circle back and attend to the motion that's pending. Your Honor, I'm Jennifer Smyrnos, counsel for the defendant. Your Honor, my name is Tiffany Katarina. I also represent the defendant. Thank you. All right, and are there any housekeeping matters that the defense would like to address before we uh, turn our attention to the motions? Your Honor, the defense has a motion remaining as well. All right. Um, we'll take up the state's first motion, which is uh, a motion eliminated to exclude a string of emails. Uh, those have been you now tendered to the court. Um, the defense response. Your Honor, the defense has no objections and will stipulate to their inadmissibility. All right. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner, <laughs> <laughs> the other motion? Yes, we may retrieve this. Any additional motions on behalf of the prosecution? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. It is understood that Big Quarters acceptance to WNL University was revoked sometime in the period after Bobby King's attempted suicide, and we object to any reference made to Big Quarters revoke acceptance to WNL throughout the course of the trial. We believe that this um, testimony would be highly prejudicial to the jury as showing some form of punishment for the crime at hand today compared to its relatively small COVID value. And so we would move for the exclusion of any reference to that revoked acceptance under Rule 403. All right. Thank you. Response? Your Honor, should the government introduce evidence that Vic Porter has not been punished for his actions today, the defense feels it is appropriate to be able to respond um, by citing these facts. All right. So in other words, if the, if the prosecution opens the door into an area that would uh, suggest that uh, the defendant has not yet been punished and that the jury should then uh, take care of that by punishing him today, you would in turn seek to introduce evidence regarding his rejection from acceptance at WNL. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Rebuttal? Response to that? Yes, Your Honor. We would again argue that this is um, unfairly prejudicial. The whether or not Big Quarter has been punished, and we would contend that there is no causation to establish that Bobby Dean's attempted suicide had anything to do with Big Quarter's revoked acceptance, we would argue again that it is prejudicial because there is no causal link between the revoked acceptance and the attempted suicide. Right, the probative value at the moment to me seems to be tentative, but it is possible that the evidence on behalf of the prosecution may clarify what the defense is concerned about and therefore um, if you intend to introduce that evidence seek a sidebar with the court I'll give you a ruling prior to the introduction of the evidence all right if you think the door has been open and just be prepared to articulate in what manner that door was opened by the prosecution's evidence yes sir all right thank you Your Honor. we have no further motions at this time all right defense motions your honor the defense has a motion to eliminate for the court at issue, there are two sets of text messages in today's case. The first set is obtained or subpoenaed from AT&T, a text message transcript. There are also text messages that were uh, obtained from Vic Porter's cell phone, and these text messages the defense moved to suppress because they are obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment. All right, and the circumstances um, surrounding the seizure of that evidence, if you could just fill me in, please. Absolutely, Your Honor. They were seized during a meeting between Vic Porter and Crystal Morrison, um, and they were seized uh, in violation of the Fourth Amendment under um, authority of Fort Bend ISD. Although school authorities do not have probable cause to obtain students' possessions, they do need to have a reasonable basis to believe that school policy is violated. To the, to the extent that the principal believed that the messages may reveal uh, bullying or uh, threatening 
um, content, would that be a violation of school policy that would allow the seizure of the evidence? Uh, Your Honor, pursuant to the harassment policy that we have in hand today, uh, the text messages, the, the reason prompting the seizure of the cell phone has to be a basis for a violation of school policy. It's our position that there was no violation of school policy. Sure. Counsel, does, um, does the exclusionary rule apply to non-constitutional uh, non uh, violations? Um, Your Honor, the, the case law universe that the council is working with today um, does say that it is a, a constitutional issue under the Fourth Amendment and that we are limited to the Fourth Amendment. Thank you. I should read the case law next. <laughs> All right, response, please. Yes, Your Honor. We would argue that <clears throat> um, in the interest of students' public safety, in this particular case, there is a high level of public safety because there is a student's life at stake. There was a student's life at stake. And under the WBL v. Fort Bend ISD case that counts, opposing counsel was referring to, that dealt merely with drug usage on school. And the school administrator had a legitimate reason to suspect that student's involvement. In this case, um, Principal Morrison did have a legitimate reason to suspect Big Quarter because of a prior incident between Big Quarter and Bobby Dean. Would, would the violation of school policy be the predicate for a proper seizure of evidence from the cell phone? Or are you arguing that some other basis would justify that seizure? We would argue both. Right. We would argue that the school policy does allow. All right. And specifically, if you could, not to cut you off, but identify what school policy you believe to have been violated as a result of um, the defendant's conduct such that um, seizure of evidence from his phone would be appropriate. Yes, Your Honor. Um, under the school policy, the, um, the, beha the behavior that um, a student, sh if you would refer like to refer to it, a student shall not intimidate or harass another student through words or actions. Such behavior includes direct physical contact, um, moving through that. This behavior, this includes behavior transmitted electronically, including but not limited to email, text messages, and websites. And directly at issue in this case are text messages and websites. All right, thank you. Rebecca? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the defense contention is that Big Porter was called into the principal's office based on an event, the attempted suicide, that occurred off campus. The harassment policy only applies to students um, that are found on school grounds while traveling to and from school-sponsored activity during the lunch period, whether on or off campus, and during school-sponsored activity. The basis for Big Porter being called into the office was uh, premised on an off-campus event, and therefore the policy does not apply. Is there evidence that the principal knew of the at least suspected bullying? Principal Morrison, is that who we're talking about? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Is there evidence that he had some evidence of the suspected bullying that occurred prior to the time that the defendant entered his office? Your Honor, the principal was aware of uh, the potential for this specific harassment the student rumors, which could be also pulling up here All right. I'm satisfied that there was a reasonable basis for the principal to believe that there was a violation of school, school policy that would justify the seizure of the evidence from the cell phone based on the case law that's been submitted, particularly the WBL versus Fort Bend Independent School District case. So the motion to suppress or the motion to eliminate, however it is styled, is denied. Any further pretrial motions? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. The defense has uh, proposed jury instructions, an additional jury instruction. Yes. We have already shown uh, the government. May I approach? You may. Thank you. Proposed instruction comes from case law out of the state Supreme Court, state of Lenfest v. ABS. Are there any objections to the proposed jury instruction? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, and I was showing a copy of this briefly before trial, but I don't have a copy of it with me. Uh, we, the state, Your Honor, agrees with the general substance of this change. However, we do object to the wording. 
Uh, we would like it to be read in the positive uh, as opposed to the negative. For example, say that the defendant can be held liable for the acts of third parties if the government proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant advocates for reasonable harassment and the relationship between the actions of third parties and the defendant was not tenuous. Uh, we believe that that is removes what's essentially a double negative and makes the instructions clear for the jury to understand. It also more accurately reflects the actual statute that these jury instructions are, are being or relate, relate to. Counsel, could I ask you, for the defendant, would you prefer an instruction that says that uh, the state, uh, in order to find the defendant liable for the acts of third parties, the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt A and B? That would be acceptable, Your Honor. No objection to that. The jury instruction as proposed will be amended pursuant to our discussion, and I will give that at the close of the evidence. Thank you. Any, any further pretrial matters that we should take up? The state is ready to proceed, Your Honor. All right, defense. We have nothing further, Your Honor. Very well. Um, we bring in the jury then. Counsel, as we're bringing the jury in, um, it, it will be my practice to allow a reasonable extension of time if you're in the midst of a statement or in the midst of a question. But if we go beyond that, I'll ask you please to request an extension of time if there are additional matters you need to address. All right. We're standing for you, folks, so you can sit down. Thank you. <laughs> State may address the jury in opening statements. Thank you, Your Honor. May I please the court, opposing counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Choices have consequences. Picture a typical Friday night in a small town, an average house with an average family. Dad's in the back porch filling some hamburgers, and Mom is helping her daughter with some math and work. A young teenage girl comes racing down the stairs at the sound of the doorbell. It's her date come to pick her up for a night out of the movies. As she walks out the door, arm in arm with her date, her parents smile at each other, proud of the happy, confident young woman that their daughter is growing into. Today you will hear that this used to be Bobby Dean's life. Today you will also hear that the choices of the defendant, Vic Quarter, derailed Bobby Dean's happy life and led to the ultimate consequence of her attempting to take her own life. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Christy Montrose, and with me as co-counsel is Matt Baker. We represent the state of Lindfest. Now today you're going to hear about the series of events that led up to Bobby Dean attempting to take her own life. You will hear how the defendant chose to send Bobby Dean several insulting text messages and how he went online to a website, the Bookface website, and created a group that was designed to intimidate and embarrass Bobby Dean. And you will hear that on October 21st, 2009, Bobby Dean attempted to take her own life because of the torture and harassment that she faced. Now, as the state, we have the burden of proof. And that means that we have to prove to you, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Vic Porter knowingly intimidated, frightened, or caused emotional distress to Bobby Dean through the use of electronic communication. Now, this is a burden to embrace, and we will be able to meet that burden here today. To meet that burden, we're going to be calling two witnesses, the first of which is Ms. Bobby Dean herself. Ms. Dean will tell you how she started off as a freshman at Midlands High. She made the varsity lacrosse team and started hanging out with the senior lacrosse players, including the defendant, Vic Quarter. You'll hear how they became friends and how that friendship came to an abrupt halt when Vic Quarter's girlfriend, Lynn Ames, broke up with Vic and started spending time with Bobby. You'll hear how this made the defendant angry. It made him so angry, in fact, he started sending insulting text messages to Bobby Dean. Now, you'll hear that Miss Dean did send some text messages of her own, and she was just trying to stand up for herself, assert herself against a senior. 
but you'll hear that the defendant took it to the next level. He went online to the website Bookface and created a group called Bobby Dean is a fucking slut. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you will hear that as the creator of this group, Bobby Dean could pick the title. He could pick the group description, he could pick the privacy settings, and he could choose who to invite, and <clears throat> he could choose control over the whole group. You'll hear how his control led to 247 members joining this group within a matter of three weeks of its creation. You will hear how Bobby Dean saw this bookface group and was horrified by its contents, embarrassed that her family would see her friends. And you will hear how after Vic Quarter's friends joined the bookface group, they followed the advice that was listed in the group description. They tormented Bobby, they harassed her, they played pranks on her at school, all to take embarrassing pictures of her to then go and post on this bookface website. And you will hear that on October 21st, 2009, Bobby Dean just couldn't take it anymore and attempted to take her own life. Vic Quarter's choices had the worst kind of consequences. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the defense is going to come up here and try to tell you a very different story. They will try to tell you that it's not Vic Quarter's fault that Bobby Dean tried to take her own life. They will tell you that it was actually the actions of other students at Midlands High that teased Bobby, harassed her, they will tell you that Big Porter is merely a scapegoat. But I ask you to pay careful attention to the choices Big Porter made that set all of these events into motion. Now the second witness we are going to call is Mr. Ari Narani. And he is a very close friend of Mr. Porter. Mr. Narani will tell you how he joined the Bookface group after Vic invited him to join. Mr. Narani will tell you that after he joined the group, read the description, he did exactly what it said. He went to school, he played pranks on Bobby Dean, he harassed her, he took pictures of her, and then went back and posted those pictures on the Bookface group. Mr. Narani will tell you that the reason he did those things is because Vic Quarter wanted him to. Mr. Narani will tell you that Vic Quarter, as the group administrator, had the sole power to disband the group. He was the only one who knew how. And that was a choice that Vic Quarter did not make. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the defense is going to come up here and they're going to hide, try to hide the facts. Hide the evidence and hide the truth. Because they know what the evidence will actually show you. However, we are going to show you some hard evidence that they can't hide from you. We're going to show you screenshots of the actual bookface page. We're going to show you Vic Quarter's name on that bookface page as the group administrator. And that is something the defense cannot explain away. They can't explain away the existence of this group, who created it, and how people found out about it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what you have heard here today, what you will hear today, is a series of tragic events. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard, what you will hear is that Vic Quarter's choices led to the devastating consequences for Bobby Dean. But today, those choices must have consequences for Vic Quarter. It is up to you to make sure that justice is served, justice that Bobby Dean deserves. It is for this reason that at the end of today's trial, my co-counsel will come before you and ask that on behalf of the state of Glenfest and on behalf of Bobby Dean, you find the defendant, Vic Quarter, guilty. Thank you. All right, will there be an opening statement at this time on behalf of the defendant? Yes, Your Honor. You may address the jury. May it please the court, opposing counsel. A play with two acts. When the curtain fell, Vic Porter was casted as a scapegoat. In the first act of this play, you would hear a story about a fight over a girl between Bobby Dean and Vic Porter. In the end, Bobby apologized and Vic moved on. In the second act of this play, however, there is a different cast of characters. This other cast of characters is what caused Bobby Dean's emotional distress. The curtain fell on October 21st, 2009, when Vic Porter was arrested for a crime he did not commit. Just one day earlier, a group of other students followed Bobby Dean home. These students taunted Bobby Dean and did other horrible things to her at school. 
Do you look here? No evidence that Vic Porter took part in what these students did to Bobby D. The actions of these students, this different cast of characters, is what caused Bobby Dean's emotional distress. But, because Vic Porter and Bobby Dean exchanged text messages one month before all this happened, the police arrested Vic Porter without interviewing any other suspects. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my name is Jennifer Smarnos. Along with my co-counsel, Tiffany Katarina, we represent Vic Porter. Vic, briefly stand up. This is Vic Porter. He is 19 years old, a lifelong resident of Johnson City, and a good student. Vic has started, founded, the Habitat for Mandy chapter at his high school and played the cross there. Although it is his right to remain silent, Vic feels so strongly about his story that you will hear it today. We ask that you refrain from judgment until after hearing what he has to say. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the government bears the burden in today's case. The government must prove each and every element of the crime beyond any reasonable doubt. Most importantly, the government must prove that Vic Porter was the legal cause of Bobby Dean's emotional distress. The government will not meet its burden of burden today because other students are responsible for what happened to Bobby Dean. And although the defense has to prove nothing, we will call two witnesses. First, you will hear from Vic Porter himself. And Vic will tell you how one month before this happened, Bobby Dean stole his girlfriend and how Bobby Dean sent the first text message to him bragging about it. To vent his frustration and heartbreak, Vic created an online group for his close friends. And that was it. He moved on and off the stage. But in the second act of this play, you will hear that other students disliked Bobby Dean. Other students, not Vic Porter, took pictures of Bobby Dean of her in class. Other students, not Vic Porter, played a prank on Bobby Dean. Other students, not Vic Porter, took Bobby Dean's clothes from her locker. And other students, not Vic Porter, followed Bobby Dean home from school that day. You will also hear from Principal Morrison. And Principal Morrison will tell you that he knew about the text messages, so he called the Johnson City Police Department. When Officer Keeley came to school, he took one look, one look, at those text messages and placed Vic Porter under arrest. <coughs> you will hear no evidence that Officer Keeley interviewed any other teachers, any parents, or more, most importantly, any other students. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a sad situation that has caused anguish for both students. As the evidence will show, no one can <coughs> what happened, but there's enough blame to go around. And when other students are at fault, it would be unjust to find the court of guilty. As I mentioned earlier, this case is about a play with two acts. At the end of the second act, Vic Porter was casted as a scapegoat for other students' actions. The defense appeals to justice and common sense. And at the conclusion of today's trial, we will ask that you find Vic Porter not guilty. Thank you. The state may call its first witness. Your Honor, this time the state calls Bobby Dean to the stand. Unfortunately, that's where I met Vic Porter. 
Well, could you tell us a little bit about the court back then? He was the most popular guy at school. Um, everyone wanted to be big. He was rich and popular. Objection, relevance. Response. Uh, Your Honor, we're simply laying foundation to potential motives uh, that may have prompted Vic Porter to engage in this harassment based on his background, based on, uh, we're also going to, this one is we testified a minute at, about uh, the about romantic ties that Vic Porter had. Right. Uh, Your Honor, the fact that Vic Porter might have been wealthy or not has no bearing on any issue of fact in his case to make it more or less profitable. Your Honor, we would disagree. We believe that the difference in contrast between Ms. Dean and Vic Porter may have actually been one of the motives behind the harassment. We definitely think it is relevant and does have at least some appropriate value. All right. I don't find that the um, prejudicial effect substantially outweighs the appropriate value, so I'll allow the question and the answer soon. Ms. Dean, could you please tell us a little bit about Vic Porter back then? He was the most popular guy at school. Um, everyone wanted to be big. He had the most friends, and he was really rich. And he was captain of the cross team. He was really cool. Um, we were friends for a while. Well, Miss Dean, do you recognize Vic Porter anywhere in the courtroom today? Yeah, he's um, wearing the jacket up there. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, let the record reflect that Bobby Dean has identified the defendant to be Vic Porter. Oh. Now, Miss Dean, you said that you and the defendant used to be friends. What happened? Well, Vic and his girlfriend, the name just broke up. And a couple of weeks later, uh, Len asked me out. And I felt like I had to say no because uh, Vic and I were friends. And, uh, but Vic found out and he was really mad. Well, how did you know that Vic was mad? At lacrosse practice a little while later, um, we were out in the field and it was a, a no contact drill. And just out of the blue, he smacked me to the ground with his lacrosse stick and um, he knocked me to the ground. And he just stood there with a the stick in his hand over me and he said, Don't forget that I need you. I can destroy you just as easily. Well, Misty, how did these threats make you feel? I'm really scared. Um, vulnerable. Did you ever do anything about this threats and harassment? I, um, I felt like I needed to stand up for myself, so uh, I finally said yes to Lynn, and we went out on a date. Um, and I sent Vic a text message just telling him how pathetic he was, because he kept being awful, and they just wanted him to leave us alone. Did the defendant respond to your text message? Yeah. Um, he said I should kill myself. Well, how did that response make you feel? Humble, like you meant it. Well, Ms. Dean, did you have any further contact with the defendant after this incident? Um, there was another time where we were outside the, the school psychologist's office, and he grabbed me to by the army, pinned me to the wall, and he said this isn't over. Well, how did those threats make you feel? I was terrified. Um, I wasn't sure what, what he was going to do. I was just going to make me Well, Ms. Dean, did these threats from the video ever materialize? Uh, one time, my little sister showed me this book based group. Um, it was called Bobby Dean is a Fugly Slut. Well, what was the general nature of the group Bobby Dean is a Fugly Slut? That was a place for people to post like embarrassing pictures of me and, and like really mean comments about me. Your Honor, at this time, let the record reflect that I'm approaching the opposing counsel, which we previously labeled State's Exhibit 8. Thank you. Permission to approach the witness? Okay. Ms. Dean, do you recognize these reproductions? <coughs> yeah, I do. What are they? Uh, this is the book based group. And how exactly do you recognize these reproductions? Well, the name is the same, uh, the picture is the same, start date, I recognize all the comments, um, and the administrator is the same too. Is it an accurate reproduction? Yeah. And how frequently did you check this page? 
a lot. Your Honor, at this time, the state would like to move Western Park State's exhibit A into evidence. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. Objection to lack of personal knowledge. The witness has laid no foundation that she has accessed the website on these specific dates. The, the screenshots are, are at the bottom of the specific dates that these the web, the web pages access. Your Honor, we believe that we have laid adequate foundation. We've discussed how much she has accessed the website. We've also laid foundation as to how frequently she accessed the website. And particularly, this website is, as it were, like a, a, like a chain. So if you access the website, say, five days after it was created, you'll see all of the comments from five day, from over those five days. So by accessing it later, it, there's no necessarily, nothing is, you, you see like the whole information that was on the page. So we leave it completely out of the foundation. I mean, is it the state's intent to make references to the content of the page from beginning to end? Uh, and if so, did we lay the foundation that she has seen all of that content? in what is state's A for identification. Your Honor, the state is going to look at several components of this work. We'll look at a particular comment that was made, as well as uh, that is time sensitive. Uh, however, we'll also the primarily primary focus of what the state is trying to draw from this is the general nature of the site, which is not going to change. For example, things like the group name, uh, the description of the group, and the group admin, which would have been the same no matter what date she accessed it. But for that particularly Per component, I would be glad to potentially further the foundation if what we laid currently is insufficient. All right, I'll give you the last word on the objection. Uh, Your Honor, additionally, we argue that, that while there are some components of this website that are <coughs> the same, the particular screenshots contain hearsay from out of court statements of other parties who have posted on this particular Facebook based group. Well, Your Honor, so, has, so in addition to foundation, there's a hearsay concern as well? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Your Honor, I have two responses to this hearsay objection. First, we contend this is not hearsay because these statements are not being provided for the truth of the matter asserted. But secondly, if that's insufficient, I would argue that essentially the defendant has adopted these statements made by third parties by allowing them to remain on the site, refusing to delete them. The defendant uh, has sole custody of the site, and therefore these statements, almost as it were like a quote book, are essentially his own statements, uh, even if they're not being, even if you find that they are being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, which I think is incorrect. All right, I, I've prepared at this point to rule that an adequate foundation for the exhibit has been laid based on the witness's testimony regarding her familiarity with it. With respect to the hearsay component, it's difficult for me to make that ruling in a vacuum. It does appear to me that it makes some sense that the statements would not be offered for their truth given the nature of the statements. However, until we get to actually um, Presenting the content of this document to the jury it would be difficult for me to know that. So the, the document is not going to be admitted at this time in its entirety. The foundation has been laid. Uh, I will allow you, however, to um, pose questions to the witness that would cause or, or ask her to describe content within the document. If you have a concern that that question will elicit hearsay testimony, then we can address it in more specific terms. But rather than go through this document point by point right now, I'd rather do it in piecemeal <coughs> response to your questions. All right? Yes, sir. Okay. Ms. Dean, who is the administrator of this group? Nick Carter. And was there any other administrator? No. And what was the stated purpose of the group? Um, tell me what you hate about Bobby Dean. Post ugly pictures, and you guys have a bunch. Um, post a horry thing about me, about it doing. Now, Ms. Dean, when you were on the website, was there any particular comment that stood out to you, perhaps the defendant made? Yeah. What would um, that comment be? Vic said, um, no one likes a slut. I'm going to make sure that Bobby never forgets to respect her elders again. Now, Ms. Dean, how did all of these comments, taken as a whole, Make you feel awful. Um, like everyone hated me. Well, what did you do about this particular group? I mean, it's a fucking slime. I broke up with Lynn, and I I texted Vic telling him as much. I um, I texted him begging for him to take the site down and just leave me alone. Uh, like with the team, um, 
I just think it was stuff. Well, how did the defendant respond to your text? He sent me a smiley face. Well, what did you interpret that smiley face to mean? I think he was laughing at me. Objection, speculation. Your Honor, where the witness is testifying based on her own knowledge, we've laid the foundation that she received the actual text message, uh, and it's what she felt it meant as opposed to what the court actually meant. And we believe this is important to show the first component of the crime in question today that the defendant, uh, or that Ms. Dean underwent emotional trauma as a result of the electronic communications of the defendant. All right, response. In other words, it appears the state is not offering it to actually establish what was in your client's mind, but rather the effect that it had on the witness and said the state's proper is that that goes to an element of the offense. Your Honor, we have no contention with the effect of the listener. I believe the question was, what did she believe that Vic meant by that? And we do believe that that goes to the calls for a state of mind in the court at the time he sent the text message. All right, I agree. I'll sustain that objection, but you can rephrase the question. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Dean, what did you feel about this text message? I felt like he was laughing at me, um, laughing at the, the bad things that were happening to me at school. Well, what sort of things are happening to you at school? Uh, my, my locker was vandalized. I, uh, there were condoms all over my desk one day, and a bunch of kids followed me all the way home after school one day. Well, what happened with your locker? You mentioned it was vandalized. I went to go get my uniform from my locker and there was a sign at the front that said this team isn't for fatties. Objection. Alright, I have to confess I didn't couldn't hear what the witness said. Do you like me to repeat the question here? Uh, I heard the question, I just didn't hear the witness's yes, response to it. Do you proper that? Response? Yes, Your Honor. The, the witness stated that she saw a sign on the locker that said this team is not for fatties. Uh, again, Your Honor, in response to the hearsay objection, this is not being offered for the truth of the matter. Asserted, it's simply being offered to, again, shed further light on the defendant's emotional, or Ms. Dean's emotional state after seeing this information. In order for me to find that it was hearsay, would I have to conclude that the team, in fact, was not for that is? I appreciate the objection and stay on the hearsay, but for now, I agree it's not offered for the street. <laughs> Ms. Dean, can you tell us a little bit about what happened here with Cross Water? I went to go get my clothes, and there was a sign on it that said, This team is in for fatties. And I, I opened my locker, and all my clothes have been replaced with extra, extra large sizes. How did the visualization of your life make you feel? Like it was fat and ugly. In addition to the installation of your locker, you mentioned that there were some condoms placed somewhere on your desk. What happened? I walked into history class, and just all over my desk were a bunch of condoms, um, and all these kids standing there laughing at me and, and taking pictures, um, and they wouldn't let me leave the room. Well, how did that having a pile of condoms on your desk make you feel this week? Awful, um, like they thought I was a slut. Well, after your locker was vandalized and your group of kids followed you home, you mentioned something about, or in, in, in the condoms you placed in your desk, you mentioned something about being followed home by a group of kids. Could you maybe describe this incident for us? Um, on October 21st, um, a bunch of kids followed me the whole way home from school. I was walking and they just kept shouting awful things at me, calling me fat and ugly. <coughs> they, they, they threw things at me through the whole way. What happened next, Ms. Dean? I ran inside my house, and um, I, I locked myself in my parents' bathroom. I just, I just wanted to go to sleep and, and leave everything. So I... I just grabbed all the pills I could find and I go up and down and like tried to kill myself. Ms. Dean, I know this is very difficult for you, but why exactly do you feel it's necessary to kill yourself? 
I felt like he made this but can make this decision, this choice to just ruin my life. And and there was nothing I could do to escape. All right, with respect to what's been marked for identification of states that it occurs to me our best approach might be to take it up outside of the presence of the jury at our next break. We can see if redactions are needed, and if they are, then uh, admit a redacted document. But the hearsay objection to the document stands, and we'll resolve it on a break. Yes, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. B, before all this happened, you started dating Bobby's ex, Vic Porter's ex girlfriend, is that right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Before all this happened, you started dating Vic Porter's ex girlfriend, is that right? No, not before everything happened, no. You dated Lynn Ames, is that right? I did eventually, yeah. And you heard Vic Porter complain to other members of the team about this, is that right? Yeah. Judge, if your honor, you're safe. Your Honor, these are statements by the party opponent, and it's been her personal knowledge that she had heard at the time that the court was receiving some members of the team. I'm not offering the other members' statements, um, only what the court said. Your Honor, they're not offering these, these may be a statement by a party opponent, but they're not being offered against the interest of that party opponent. I understand. I, I'm not seeing how those statements are being offered for their truth. I'll allow their um, testimony over the hearsay <coughs> So, Ms. Kim, you heard Vic Porter complain to the members of the lacrosse team, is that right? Yeah, he seemed really mad. And in response, you first sent Vic Porter a text message, isn't that correct? Yeah, when he will leave me alone. And in that text message, you told Vic Porter, why don't you start an escort service? Objection, Your Honor, you're safe. Your Honor, these statements are not being offered for the truth of the matter, only to explain Bobby's subsequent action. Your Honor, to the extent that these statements are not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted that that's part of the statements that have a problem with and how we would contend that this is sort of going in a roundabout way to, 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 re to reflect directly on the character of both the <coughs> and the defendant, and we think that that component, so we believe there's a mixed use, we request that that particular component be allowed, but that there be some sort of uh, instruction about the exact nature of how this should be interpreted. All right, it sounds like we're getting into banner back and forth here that sort of sets up where things ultimately went by way of background. But that starting an escort service and um, being critical of the physical appearance of one another doesn't necessarily rise to a hearsay statement. And I'm not seeing yet that we're in a realm of character evidence either in the 404 or 405 range or in the 600. So uh, if we get to that point, then I'll give an instruction on how the jury should consider character evidence. And I'll be mindful of that, so I appreciate you pointing that out. But for now, the objections are for the Ms. King, as I asked, you sent Big Porter text messages telling him to start an escort service. I don't remember what I said. I remember it was a meme, or it was a meme, and I apologize later. I, I don't remember specifically what I said. Again, back to my questions. You also said the court of text message saying, everyone knows you're easy. Is that right? Like I said, I, I don't remember what I said. I'm sorry. Objection, Your Honor, to that question. Uh, it's a compound question that asks, uh, you also sent the court of text message, uh, and we would request that defendant either refer the defense to rephrase the question so that it could potentially, the witness's answer may have been based on uh, a misunderstanding of that question. It's essentially a compound question. All right, um, you can respond. Right, Your Honor, you have to rephrase that at this time. The content we were referring to was in the form of a text message. So it's implicit that she sent it, and we're referring to what she sent it for. All right, I think, as I understood it, and um, I think the record will reflect that she had acknowledged sending one text message, although she couldn't remember exactly the content, and that the also was just uh, a follow-up to that. So for now, at least I'm not concerned about the compound nature of the question. The objections are cool. Ms. Dean, in this text message you first sent Vic Porter, you basically told him how pathetic he was. Is that right? Yeah, I felt like I needed to say that for myself. Now I'd like to talk to you about events that happened when you were at school. 
Students started picking on me, didn't they? Yeah, they did. These other students put a box of condoms on your desk. I'm not sure who it was, but yeah, I walked in the class and they were just everywhere. <coughs> and these other students played a prank on your gym walk, as you heard earlier. I'm, I'm not sure who it was, but yeah, a bunch of kids did. I probably felt awful, didn't it? It's horrible. As you testified there, you didn't see Vic Porter with a box of condoms on your desk. I didn't see who did or did, didn't I? I don't know. But after you found the box of condoms, you didn't see Vic Porter take pictures of you, did you? <coughs> he wasn't in the room when I was in there. No. So Vic Porter wasn't in the room laughing at you either, is that right? No, but he, there were all these kids taking pictures who knew what he said to do. You didn't see Vic Porter calling home from school that day, did you? I don't, I don't know if he was in the car or not. Again, my question was, <coughs> you may not know if he's in the car. You didn't see Vic Porter in the car, is that right? No, I didn't see him. You just figured Vic Porter had something to do with him? Because of the group, yeah. No further questions. Redirect to Sammy. No redirect. All right, Sammy, you may step down. Thank you. Take the call, sir. Yes, Your Honor. We'd like to call R.A. Nurani. Thank you. Could you please introduce yourself to the court? Yeah, I'm R.A. Nurani. How old are you, Mr. Nurani? 19. Do you know the defendant, Big Corner? Yeah. Vic and I go way back. How do you know, Mr. Porter? We're on the cross team all through high school. Now, Mr. Nurani, I'd like to ask you why you were here today. Not because I want to be. You told me I had to come. Subpoena or something like that. And Mr. Nurani, you understand that despite your friendship with Mr. Porter, you have to tell the truth here today, correct? Yeah. All right, Mr. Nurani. Do you also know who Bobby Dean is? Yeah, I know Bobby. How do you know Bobby? Well, she tried out for the varsity team for lacrosse when she was a freshman, and she was pretty good. She made it. Did the defendant and Bobby Dean know each other as well? Yeah, we all hung out for a couple weeks in September at the beginning. What happened when you started hanging out with Bobby Dean? Everything was fine at first, but uh, it kind of went south when uh, Lynn Ames, Vic's girlfriend, broke up with him. There was major drama after that. <laughs> what do you mean by major drama? Well... <clears throat> I mean, Lynn kind of started hanging out with Bobby a lot. Um, you know, Lynn started tutoring Bobby, and then I think they went out to dinner once. Vic was just upset. I mean, he was, he was resented it. How did you know that Mr. Porter resented it? He told me. Did Mr. Porter tell you anything else? Yeah, I mean, he, he started saying that he wanted to do something about it. So one day he went home and created this book face group. Now, before we talk about this specific book face group, can you tell me what book face is exactly? Yeah, it's just this social networking site on the internet. I mean, you can go on and create your own profile and talk about what you like. You can create groups and join them. For example, I'm in the Touchdown Jesus group and the 21 is too old group. Now, Mr. Ryan, <laughs> how familiar are you with the website book face? Oh, I'm on it like every day. I have been ever since junior year in high school when my mom finally let me get one. Well, let's go back to this specific book face group you mentioned that Mr. Porter created. Can you tell me what it was all about? It was all about Bobby Dean. How did you know it was all about Bobby Dean? He called it Bobby Dean is a fugly slut. Now, Mr. Nirani, would you recognize this book face group if you saw a screenshot of it? Yeah, I checked it like every day. Motion to approach opposing counsel. Let the record reflect I'm showing opposing counsel what has been previously referred to as prosecution exhibit A and B. Permission to approach? Okay. Do you recognize those documents, Mr. Nirani? Yeah, these are screenshots of the, of the book face group. One from October 2nd last year and the other from October 21st. 
How do you know that that's what they are? Well, I mean, I check them every day, like I said. Do you recognize any names on that those of these screenshots? Yeah, a lot of them. Um, Vix is on here. Where do you see Vic Quarter's name on that page? Uh, he posted a couple times, and he's the group admin. What is a group admin? It's the guy who creates the group. What exactly does a group admin do? I mean, they run it. They, you know, decide privacy settings. They're the only ones who can invite members and let them in. They write the group description. Well, let's start with the group description. Can you tell me what the group description of this particular group is? Yeah, it says, um, tell me what you hate about Bobby Dean. Post ugly pictures. I know you must have a thousand, lol. Post what hoary things Bobby spotted doing. Now, who wrote that description, Mr. Narani? It was Vic. How do you know that it was Mr. Porter? Because the group admin is the only one who can write the description. Now, you mentioned, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned the members of the group. How many members were there? How, how did you, in fact, find out about this group, Mr. Narani? I mean, Vic invited me to join. And did you accept that invitation? Yeah, I had Vic's back on this one. So on the date that you joined, do you remember what date that was? Yeah, it was October 1st, I think. Do you remember how many members were in the group on the date that you joined? Yeah, there were seven of us, including me and Vic. Just, you know, the inside group on the lacrosse team. Now, how often did you check this book face group? Like I said, I was on there every day. I mean, you know, Vic and I were tight. We were, you know, I just back. Do you remember the last time you checked this group? Yeah, um, I think it was October 21st or 22nd. And do you remember how many members were in the book face group, Bobby Dean's a fucking slut, on October 21st or 22nd? 247. Okay, and when you last checked in late October, how many days later was that from when you first joined? Three weeks. All right, Mr. Narani, after you joined this book face group, what did you do? I mean, I did what Vic said to do. You know, I started putting Bobby in awkward situations, taking pictures, putting him on the website. You know, I wanted to make him feel better. Why did you do this, Mr. Narani? I mean, you know, Vic was the guy. He's the most popular guy in high school. He was my friend. He told me to do something, I did it. How long did you continue taking pictures, posting comments about Bobby Dean? I mean, I kept doing it for about a week and a half. Um, one day, Vic came up to me and he kind of put his arm around me and said, I think you and I can stop posting here. He said, that, you know, I think they've got it. There were about 100 people at that time on the website. Now, I'd like to talk to you about this book face group being deleted. Did Vic Porter ever talk to you about deleting Bobby Dean as a fugly slut? Well, I asked him one day if he was going to take it down. And he said, nah, I don't even know how. Do you know how to take down a group? Yeah, and I, you know, I offered to show him how. Did he accept your offer? No. No, he didn't. So, Mr. Narani, did Vic Quarter ever delete the book face group Bobby Dean is a fugly slut? No. Nothing further at this time. Cross examination. All right, my name is Tiffany Katarina. I represent Mr. Porter. I'm going to ask you a few questions. All right. On direct, you talked a lot about the book face group. Um, you mentioned that Big Quarter was the administrator. That's right. You also said that Big Quarter had the power to invite people. Is that correct? Yeah, because he was the group admin. He's the only one who could actually invite people into the group. But isn't the book face group set to public? Right, that just means that if you go and look at the group, anyone can see it. You actually have to be a member to post on it. But anyone can be a member without being invited, isn't that right? No. Let's talk about the description that you read. It says that uh, members should post pictures that they have of Bobby, isn't that correct? Right. It doesn't say that they should take pictures of Bobby, isn't that correct? I mean, it doesn't say one way or another. It, just it doesn't say that pictures. they should take pictures of Bobby, is that correct? 
It says to post ugly pictures, that's right. It doesn't say to pull pranks on Bobby, isn't that correct? Not specifically. And it doesn't say to send Bobby text messages, isn't that correct? No. It doesn't say that. Right, it doesn't say that. All right. You testified that the group was created on October 1st, is that correct? At least that's when I got the invite to join, yeah. Well, it, it says right there when it was created, isn't that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. And it says October 1st, 2009, correct? That's right. And you can see the comments posted on that page, is that correct? Yeah, you can see them as long as you go in there, and they're on these screenshots too. And the last date that Big Quarter posted a comment to that page was on October 2nd of 2009, isn't that right? Uh, yeah, it looks like it. And the majority of the posts to that page came well after October 2nd, 2009. You mean on the second screenshot? Yes, uh, it, the, in the total shots that you have there. Well, I mean, this only shows the shots from the 21st and the 2nd. So, I mean, it doesn't show all the stuff that posted in between that. But you visited the site every day, isn't that correct? Yeah. So you would know if there were lots of comments after Vic stopped posting on the second, isn't that correct? Right. And there were a lot of comments, isn't that right? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people posted on here, you invited a bunch of people to it. Thank you. All right, you also talked about some pranks that were pulled on Bobby. Yeah. Um, isn't it true that you were one of the students that vandalized his locker? Objection, Your Honor, irrelevant. Your Honor, we're trying to determine the cause of the emotional distress. I think it's pertinent as to who is performing these pranks and why. Your Honor, we would argue that this information is more prejudicial than probative because that <clears throat> because Mr. Morani's actions do not have anything to do with Big Quarter's actions as well. I'll have a question. Thank you, Your Honor. Objections are cool. Isn't it true that you were one of the students that vandalized Bobby Dean's lacrosse locker? Yeah, I mean, just like Vic, I wanted to get back at Bobby for what she did to him. And Vic Porter was not present when that locker was vandalized, isn't that right? No, no, he wasn't there. I mean, he had history at the time. In fact, after Vic found out that you vandalized the locker, he made you run laps, isn't that right? <laughs> yeah, Coach got pretty upset. He had to do something about it. So Vic Porter, as captain of the lacrosse team, instructed you to run laps? Yeah, like I said, Coach was really upset about it happening. Something had to be done, I guess. And Vic, you also mentioned that there was a prank on Bobby that involved condoms. You were one of the students that put condoms on the desk, isn't that right? Yeah, I was, I was in with Bobby in Mr. Anderson's history class. I was, I was involved in that. And Vic Porter wasn't present at that prank either, was he? No, he didn't have Mr. Anderson's class. Vic Porter wasn't even in that class, isn't that right? Right. And you were also one of the students that followed Bobby Dean home from school the day he attempted to take his life, isn't that right? No. Um, I'm sorry, you have the Facebook group right there? Uh, yeah, that's right. Could you please read, a uh, permission to approach Right. Could you please read your posting on <coughs> the day of October, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I will start. Sorry. You testified that Big Quarter uh, did not expand the book based group, is that correct? That's right. But he did ask you to stop posting on it, isn't that right? Right, he said he thought that he and I could stop posting at that point. <coughs> but you didn't stop posting after that, did you? I went on there every now and then. So even though Vic Quarter asked you not to do something, you did it anyway, isn't that right? For the posting, you mean? Yes. Yeah, that, you know, I went on there every now and then. Thank you, no further questions. Redirect the exam. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Neroni, those pranks are in council mentioned. Why did you commit those pranks? For Vic. I mean, it's what he told us to do in the bookface site. No further questions. Any further questions for this one? No, thank you. All right, you may step down. Thank you. Any further evidence on behalf of the state? At this time, the state rests, Your Honor. Any evidence on behalf of the defendant? Yes, Your Honor. At this time, we'd like to call Vic Porter.
I'm Vic Carter. Vic, did you attend Midlands High School? I did. And while you attended Midlands High School, did you know Bobby Dean? Yeah, she was a freshman when I was a senior, and she was never on the cross. Can you describe your relationship with Bobby Dean? Yeah, we were friends at first, um, and then the friendship deteriorated. Why did your friendship deteriorate? Well, Bobby faked having trouble in math to get my girlfriend at the time, Lynn Ames, to tutor him. Um, and they were flirting and... Objection, speculation. Your Honor, the witness is simply testifying as to what he believed the circumstances were. They're going to um, indicate why he behaved uh, subsequently as he did. Right, he's, not, he's not saying that this is true. He's saying this is what he heard and why he responded. Response? I would respond that this is what the defendant heard is hearsay. Right. From, I didn't hear the source of his information. Uh, the last words out of his mouth were that they were flirting. And I presume from the way it was said that that was a direct observation. But uh, if you Your could Honor, he, te the question. he testified that he heard that um, Bobby Dean asked for math help right. and that the two flirted afterwards. All right. Um, the background information, I assume, is not being off offered for its truth? No, Your Honor. It's simply to show the effect on the court. All right. I'll allow for that limited purpose. Members of the jury, you're going to hear some information mm -hmm. that Mr. Porter heard from others not to uh, consider it for its truth, just the effect that it had on Mr. Porter and any subsequent actions that he took. Mr. Thank Porter, you. could you please continue with um, what happens to your relationship with Bobby Dean? Well, like I said, um, Bobby and I heard that Bobby and, and Lynn were flirting. I actually saw it also. Um, looking back on it, I realized that's what was happening. I didn't suspect him at the time because we were friends. but. A uh, little while later, Lynn broke up with me and started dating Bobby. Uh, so Bobby and I got in a fight over that. Can you describe that fight? Sure. Um, it started at the cross practice. Uh, and during a drill, um, I hit Bobby uh, probably a little bit harder than the situation called for. Uh, told her to back off. That's how it started. That's how the fight started? Mm -hmm. Uh, what happened next to the Well, she sent me a text message, um, a very, very insulting text message. Would you be able to identify that text message? Absolutely, yes. Your Honor, I'm showing opposing counsel what has been previously marked defense exhibit one. Your Honor, we would ask that these, um, that defense exhibit one be immediately moved into evidence. It is a self authenticating document under Rule 902. It is a subpoena of uh, Bobby Dean's cell phone transcripts directly from ABC. <coughs> so we request that these be moved into evidence at this time. Any objection? Any objection, Your Honor. All right, proceed. May I approach You may. Thank you. Approach copies, sir. Okay, and receive this defense exhibit one without objection. <coughs> and may I approach the witness? You may. This is a transcript of all text messages sent and received from Bobby Dean's cell phone. Do you see on that transcript the message that Bobby Dean sent to you after that request? Yes, I see it right here. Would you read it out loud to the court? Sure. It says, why don't you just start an escort service? Everyone knows you're easy and you will go to hell. What did you do after you received that message? Well, I handled it how I thought I could. I, I showed it to the authorities, who Dr. Richards, who's a school psychologist, um, and wanted to deal with it that way. And when you went to Dr. Richards, what did she do? She set up a meeting between myself, um, Dr. Richards, Principal Morrison, and Bobby Dean. And what happened at this meeting? We discussed the incident, and they made Bobby apologize to me. So was the fight over after that? No, it wasn't. Why not? Well, it, I didn't think that the apology was sincere. Um, so I went home and sent a text message to Bobby, um, calling her names like bad and ugly, and I told her to save us all some trouble and engine. Those are some pretty harsh words. 
Yeah, I mean, I consider them very harsh, uh, and, I, and I feel badly about it, but they didn't seem to bother Bobby at all. How do you know that they didn't bother Bobby? Well, she responded with a text not long after that. Would you be able to identify that text? Absolutely. <coughs> do you see it on the transcript? Yes. Could you read it out loud to the court? Absolutely. It said, good try. I didn't even get in trouble. So now I have your babe, and soon I'll have your popularity. Daddy can't do anything about that XOXO. <coughs> so what happened next in the fight? Well, like I said, I was really upset, and I wanted to vent some frustration. Um, so I went home and started the book face page about Bobby. And what did you call that book face group? Bobby Dean's a public slut. And who did you invite to join? I enjoyed, I invited uh, six of my friends from the lacrosse team. After you invited those six members, did you ever invite anyone else? No. What day did you create the book face group? It was on October 1st of 2009. And when was the last time you posted or even visited the book face group? The following day, October 2nd. Did you ever intend for Bobby Dean to see the book face group? <coughs> no, it was just a way for me to vent some frustration. And did anyone ever indicate to you that Bobby Dean had seen the book face group? No. <coughs> so, what happened after you made the book face group? Well, a little while later, um, Bobby sent me a text message uh, asking me to end the fight. And did you end the fight? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, my frustration was out, so I sent her a smiley face to say, you know, I got the message. So, Call it, call it off, and that was the end of it. And when did you send the smiley face to indicate that the fight was over? Uh, a few days later, I think October 5th. Did you ever send Bobby another text message after October 5th of 2009? No. Did you ever send Bobby an email after October 5th of 2009? No. Did you ever even talk to Bobby after October 5th of 2009? No. But did you hear about other students at school harassing Bobby Dean? I did. I heard of a couple of different instances, um, the ones that were mentioned about uh, her locker being vandalized. Um, I heard some people put some condoms on her desk in history class, and also that some students had followed her home from school one day. Did you ever encourage those students to do those things? No. Protection meeting? You can rephrase the question. Did, did you ever ask other students to prank Bobby Dean? No, and I wouldn't. I mean, when I found out about the vandalized locker, I was upset because, you know, you shouldn't treat someone that way. Uh, and so I found out who was responsible, and I punched them and made them run laps. Who did you find out was responsible? Um, Ari and some other people from the lacrosse team. And what was your relationship to Ari and the other students from the lacrosse team? Uh, I was very good friends with them. And you punched them even though they were good friends with you? Yeah, I mean, if they were good friends or not, it's still not the way to treat somebody, even someone who you're in a fight with. Did you ever ask any other students to send Bobby Dean a text message? No. It's not suggesting an answer. I'll allow a question. Thank you. I'll repeat it. Did you ever ask other students at Midlands High School to send Bobby Dean text messages? No. I have nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Mr. Porter. That's my first. You are currently 19 years old, is that correct? Correct. You testified on direct that you created a book face group, is that right? Yes. A book face group titled Bobby Dean is a Fugly Slut. Yes. Let the record reflect I am showing opposing counsel what has been previously referred to as prosecution exhibit A and B. Permission to approach you? Yes. Mr. Corder, I can you a screenshot of the book face group, Bobby Dean, the Bobby Slut? Yes. Now, this is the group you created, correct? Correct. Now, I'd like to draw your attention over to the left hand <coughs> side where it says group admin. Do you see where it says that? I do. And it says Vic Corner underneath that, doesn't it? It does, yes. And that's you? Yes. All right, now, as the group admin of this, that means you created the group. Yes. 
It means you control the group. Uh, no, I don't. People can post that I have no control over that. But you wrote the group title? I wrote the group title, yes. And you wrote the group description? Yes. All right. Now, I would actually like to talk about that group description. Okay. Um, I'd like for you to read along silently while I read aloud. Tell me what you hate about Bobby Dean. Post ugly pictures. I know you must have a thousand. LOL. Post what horrid thing Bobby spotted doing. Now, Mr. Porter, did I read that correctly? Yes. You wrote this description, correct? I did, yes. Now, as group administrator of Bobby Dean, as a ugly slut, you have the ability to invite people to join the group, correct? Correct. And so you did, in fact, invite, you said, six other people to join the group. Yes. And you know, <coughs> six other people who made fun of Bobby on this group, correct? Uh, yes. And you and those other members posted some <coughs> other pictures of Bobby, didn't you? Uh, I never posted any pictures. Do you recall giving a witness statement in this case, Mr. Porter? Yes, I do. Permission to the I'm handing you a copy of your witness statement. Okay. Do you recognize it? Yes. Will you put to the back page? Is your signature on there? It is. And the date, is there a date on there as well? It's June 10th, 2010. All right. Um, for benefit of opposing counsel, I'll be referring to lines 53 and 54, if you wouldn't mind flipping over to that. And I'd ask you to read along silently <coughs> while I read aloud. Um, we posted, we made fun of Dean and posted some other pictures of Dean. Did I read that correctly, Mr. Porter? Yes. All right. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you now about um, the wall posting section of the book face page. So if you wouldn't mind flipping back over there. Sure. Um, if you wouldn't mind looking at the bottom of the page where it says, um, if you'll read silently and I'll read aloud. No one likes a slut. I'm going to make sure that Bobby Dean never forgets to respect elders again. Ha, ha, ha. Now, Mr. Porter, did I read that correctly? Yes. I see a name next to this wall post. Do you see that name? Yes. That name is Vic Porter, isn't it? It is. Now, <clears throat> Mr. Porter, after you posted the comment on the wall, did other people post on the wall after you did? Yes. Mr. Porter, you never deleted this book page group, did you? No, I didn't. Why did you not delete it? Well, I made it just then from frustration, um, got that out, and sort of forgot about it, uh, and then I, you know, I didn't really know how anymore. You did know enough to create the group, correct? Correct. And you did know that you had the power to disband this group, didn't you? Yeah, I had the power and the ability. But in fact, you never deleted this book based group. That's correct. And you never asked for help in disbanding this book based group. I don't remember. Now, Mr. Porter, you talked on direct about some text messages that Bobby Dean sent you. And um, I'd like to ask you about, in what has been previously admitted as Defense Exhibit 1, the text message you seem to have skipped over when you were reading those two that Bobby Dean sent you. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll read aloud while you read along silently. Bobby, fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life. So why don't you just save us all some trouble and end it? Did I read that correctly, Mr. Porter? No, but you left out some unimportant things. So I, I can read it again. Would you like me to read it again? No, it's okay. So is that a yes, I read it correctly, or? You got the substance correct, yes. How about I read it again? <laughs> All right. You ready? I am. Ha, you have no idea who you're messing with. Bobby, fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, okay? Why don't you just save the rest of us some trouble and end it? Is that correct? Close enough. Is that a yes? <laughs> it's okay, okay, I said okay, but yes. So yes, that I read it correctly. Almost, yes. <laughs> no One letter. All right, any further questions? Yes. On cross, you were asked why you didn't disband the book face group. Did you take any action to mitigate the Facebook group? Yeah, I, group? I told them to stop posting, stop doing anything. 
is it related to Bobby? Who did you tell to stop posting? I told Ari and the other people that I invited to the group. And Vic, <coughs> you were asked on cross about the text message you sent in between Bobby's other text messages. Is that correct? Yep. Was that text message just part of the fight? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I told the members of the jury about it uh, when you were asking me uh, first when I mentioned that I <coughs> called her fat and stupid and told her she should end it. It was just part of the banter, the text going back and forth. So after that text message, did you receive another text from Bobby? Yes. Um, that was the one um, where Bobby said um, that she ha that she has my girl and she'll send him my popularity and there's nothing daddy can do about it and sort of rubbed it in with that XOXO at the end of it. And the, what was the date you sent your text message that was read several times? What date did you send that to Bobby? I believe it was September 27th. Do you still have a kind of one in front of you? I do not. It was Thanks. taken. May I approach Ryan? You may. Why don't you tell us the exact date you sent it? Uh, that was September 27th. Thank you. I have no objection. Any further questions? Yeah. Sir, you may step down. Thank you. Okay. The defense may call its next witness. Your Honor, the defense calls Principal Morrison. My name is Dr. Blair Morrison. And what do you do for a living? I'm the president at Midlands High School. Principal. <laughs> As president or as a principal, what are some of your responsibilities? Uh, I supervise the uh, teachers. I'm a liaison with the uh, school board, and of course, I oversee all student activities and achievements. Could you please tell ladies and gentlemen about your educational background? Uh, I attended Western Washington's uh, University. Um, I got a BA in uh, teaching, and I have a PhD from Maryland in uh, education with an emphasis on inner classroom dynamics. Your Honor, at this time, the defense moves to admit Dr. Morrison as an expert in the field of educational administration. Your Honor, the uh, state objects. We believe that the defense has not laid uh, anything like sufficient foundation to qualify this uh, witness as an expert, uh, as specifically regarding the methodology of this testimony and the basis of it. Uh, and we would request permission at this time to conduct a vote here of the witness. Are you in any opposition to brief Wadir? No, Your Honor. All right. You may Wadir. Now, uh, <coughs> Principal Morrison, uh, you say you have a PhD from the University of uh, Maryland? Yes, I do. And you didn't bring a copy of that uh, degree to you today, did you? I do not have my CV on me. Didn't bring a copy of your undergrad degree? I, I don't travel with these and, things. And as you said, you didn't bring a copy of your CV? <laughs> no, I did not. Now, uh, Principal Morrison, uh, when you were at, you would generally say that you have sort of a unorthodox approach to education, isn't that correct? How do you mean? Well, Mr. Morrison, uh, isn't it true that your PhD thesis at the University of Maryland was entitled Sticks and Stones? Uh, yes, it was. And it proposed that bullying was actually good for kids, didn't it? Uh, to a degree, yes, I did. I believe that it prepares kids for the world. The world is not nice. The world, you do not need to be treated with kids' gloves. But I also say that extreme bullying, and bullying take to extreme levels, is very, very harmful for children. But, back to my question, Mr. Morrison, you do believe that, at least to some extent, bullying is good for kids? Yeah, razzing, teasing, kind of friendly banter back and forth is very good for, that's how we interact as a society in general. So, in, in fact, your testimony that roughing kids up a little bit is a good thing. You're putting words in my mouth, but roughing up kids. I never said anything about physical abuse or any kind of physical altercations with children. You never said anything about physical abuse with children? No. So it's not your testimony that toughening kids up through bullying is a good thing? Well, the word toughening does not mean to the physical toughening of it. This could be mental toughening. 
Um, you see this in brother and sister relationships. You see this with teammates. It is a kind of a bond formed between people, and it's not all nice how you do. Sometimes it's picking on people for wearing shirts or something. So, Mr. Morrison, it's your testimony that your educational philosophy is that toughening kids up through mental anguish is a good thing. My testimony is that people will be people, and we don't need to live in this theoretical world where everyone is nice to each other, because everyone is not nice to each other. So back to my question, is your testimony of toughening kids up through bullying is a good thing? Through light jazzing and razzing, yes. And, and Mr. Dean, or excuse me, Professor Principal Morrison, this is not exactly an orthodox view of education, is it? Uh, I, it, it could be taken as a lot of leaks. I think you're taking it to the extreme by saying that I advance the physical abuse of children. But Professor Moore, or Principal Morrison, back to my question, is an unorthodox view of education that toughening kids up through bullying is actually a good thing. Objection relevance. Well, I, I guess if we're talking about this witness's qualifications then and limiting the inquiry to that, that would be, I would agree. If we're getting into methodology and getting into a broader challenge regarding the admissibility of the expert's testimony, then the degree to which it's accepted within his field would be one factor at least that the court would consider under the rules of evidence. So I will allow the question on that basis. <coughs> and the objections are ruled. So, Principal Morrison, back to my question. Is an unorthodox view of education that toughening kids up through mental bullying is a good thing? Yes. No further questions. And, Your Honor, we review our objection. Uh, we believe that this witness's uh, educational background has not been proven by the defense, and in addition, and therefore is uh, insufficient to qualify him as an expert, and sufficient, and in addition, we believe that his unorthodox testimony, uh, that he's relying on an unorthodox methodology, uh, testifying as an expert that is held by, to the state's knowledge, only per Principal Morrison, and therefore is also inadmissible as an expert in education of any type. All right, class of dynamics. All right, we're obviously at our constructive sidebar here. If you could please address the uh, qualifications, but only briefly, and then the testimony regarding um, whether or not the witnesses uh, views on a particular subject matter that will be actually testified to, and that's important because I don't know what he would propose to testify to, um, whether that is accepted or not within his community. Your Honor, again, we believe that Dr. Morrison has a requisite skill, experience, and knowledge to qualify as an expert in the field of education administration, um, that he elected to raise PhDs and his um, BA support today. Um, we believe there's no bearing that they do exist, and that is not in dispute. Furthermore, his testimony is not being offered to explain his perspective on school bullying or having to do with the social dynamics between the students. He will merely testify as to what he observed in his capacity as principal. All right, if you could be a little more specific as to what you would have this witness testify to as an expert, as opposed to direct observations, which would seem to me to be more factual in nature. What opinions is he going to be asked to give? Your Honor, he is going to be asked to explain the bullying policy at the high school. All right, so that would, that would perhaps at least arguably implicate then his view of bullying whether it is or isn't appropriate in certain situations, which he has acknowledged is perhaps an unorthodox view. How does that set a foundation for admissibility under uh, Rule 702? Uh, you are to hear no testimony on direct from Dr. Morrison about his views about um, the social dynamics between students, merely that he's going to testify to the procedural aspects of school bullying and through the channels. Um, that they reach regarding these incidents. All right. What I understand is that he's going to testify regarding the propriety of certain policies that address school bill bullying. And it sounds like, from what he said, that his views on that subject are not uh, in the mainstream. And I'm wondering whether or not, under Rule 702, in your view, that <coughs> necessarily then disqualifies him as an expert under the standard that I have to apply as gatekeeper. 
Your Honor, we understand, uh, or the defense believe that he will, again, not, he will not give his opinion in this matter on any, uh, any relation to what he's written as on his PhD. Namely, he's just going to explain uh, school procedure and not reference um, any uh, personal opinion of, as to the propriety of the school policy. Right. Um, he's just going to explain what the procedure is. Yes, Your Honor. But he's not going to give an opinion as to whether it is a proper procedure or whether it ought to be in some way enhanced. No, Your Honor, he will not. All right, with that said, is there any objection then to his testimony regarding the school's procedure if he's not going to comment on its quality? Your Honor, we believe that his comments on the procedure actually direct, directly relate to what his views on bullying are. Uh, I believe that Professor Morris, or Principal Morrison has had input on the creation of this policy. Uh, in addition, he's supervised the uh, implementation of the policy. And I think that that subjective implementation and the creation of the policy do implicate his views on bullying. And furthermore, if he's simply going to testify to what the policy actually is, uh, we see no need to qualify him as an expert. All right. I'm satisfied that the witness has the requisite training through his education and experience to testify as an expert with respect to school or educational administration. Um, We've condensed what would likely have been a multiple hour daughter hearing into a um, three minute exchange. And um, I think that's as far as we can go, although I would be intrigued to go further. Um, I think that the mere fact that the witnesses um, views on bullying might not be in the mainstream alone under Daubert as opposed to Fry would not disqualify him as an expert to give testimony on this issue. It is a factor to be considered, but not a dispositive factor. Uh, I would be eager to hear more about his methodology, but given the proffer that he's simply going to explain what the policy is and will offer no opinions as to its propriety, will not compare it to others, I'll allow his testimony limited to that extent. But the objection is well no, thank you. <coughs> Dr. Morris, how do you address bullying at Midland High School? We have a district-wide policy in place where anytime any bullying is reported to us, and it often is reported to us through rumors, we have a staff psychologist who uh, interviews both sides and gets to the bottom of any underlying issue. So now I'd like to direct your attention to the events that occurred last year. Do you know Vic Porter? I do. How do you know Vic? Uh, Vic has been through Midlands High for four years, and he was one of our exemplary students. Do you also know Bobby Dean? I do. Uh, Bobby is now a sophomore at Midlands High School, and I've known her through her freshman year. Are you aware of any incidents that occurred between the two? Uh, I do. Um, Objection, Your Honor, this question calls for speculation of lack of foundation under 602. Response. Uh, Your Honor, the subject to testify is within his personal knowledge, um, as the, his testimony will provide that he has laid um, foundation through the school policy that there was an incident that was important to him that he met with both students. Your Honor, may I hear you up? The witness needs to lay this foundation first under 602 before he can testify to precisely what happened. He needs to explain any sort of foundation that he uh, did have for that. You haven't seen that yet. In the right, I'd, right. I'd be interested to hear how he gathered the information. So we'll leave the objection pending for right now. Lay that foundation as to how he became aware of the incident. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How did you become aware of any incidents that occurred between the <coughs> and the order? I was notified through Dr. Richards, our staff psychologist. Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Response to the hearsay, Judge. Uh, Your Honor, pursuant to policy, um, Dr. Richards um, referred the matter to him, not necessarily spoke to the person. All right. Pursuant to school policy. His knowledge of what happened, and he's going to testify as to the facts of what happened. It sounds like that came from an out-of-court declarant. So how would we get around the hearsay concern uh, in that context? Your Honor, the actual meeting will not elicit hearsay. There are statements by Bobby Dean, the party opponent, and Vic Porter. Um, but again, pursuant to school policy, 
um, the defense position could be that it's a subject to the business record uh, rule and that the policy is part of the business record that is um, kept with regularity within the school and Dr. Morrison as custodian of the policy would be able to certify its existence and its procedure. All right, and, and for purposes of admitting the policy, should you seek to do so, then I certainly think that that might get us there. But um, my concern is that the information that this witness obtained regarding any incidents between the defendant and the alleged victim um, would have come from a out-of-court declarant. And as best I can tell, at least, he would be uh, addressing them for purposes of establishing that the incident did happen. So I will sustain the hearsay objection, but that does not exclude you from addressing the comments that were made to him personally when he had the subsequent meeting. Permission to strike, Your Honor? Move to strike. Members of the jury, you'll disregard any question or answer uh, regarding uh, this witness's knowledge of an incident um, based on a uh, source from Dr. Richards, I believe, is the source. Dr. Morrison, in the subsequent meeting, what happened in your office between Bob and the victim? Uh, there had been, for a few days, some text messages back and forth and some grumbling back and forth, and I had them shake hands, apologize to each other, and move on. Yeah, may I approach closing? May. Let the record reflect that I am showing closing counsel was previously marked defense demonstrative exhibit one. Foundation concerns specifically um, are what? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, my foundation concerns are <coughs> with the components within other students. Other students did, and it gives like a list of, of, of particular things. Uh, we have the same foundation that, for that Principal Morrison knows this, and in fact, I believe that he cannot lay this foundation and will not be able to uh, in the course of this trial, and that's reflected on that demonstration. It's outside of his scope of knowledge. All right. And I, I believe in order for the demonstrative to be used with this particular exhibit, the foundation would need, or with this particular witness, the foundation would need to be laid that he knows of these facts before we actually uh, broadcast this to the jury. So if you can lay that foundation, which I've not yet heard, um, then we can um, deal with the uh, foundation objection. With respect to the relevancy objection, um, you're not seeking to have this admitted to go back to the jury just to use for, for um, illustrating this witness's yes, testimony? Yes, All right. Then I'm not as concerned about the 
uh, relevancy uh, objection, if that's the limitation of its use. But this is a Dr. Morrison. The timeline in this case is very important. When did, when did Bobby Dean first send a text message to the quarter? Objection, Your Honor, speculation. Six, 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 seven, nine, objection. This question still says speculation. Right. It, it's determined how he would know first, and then he can give the answer as to the substance, how he came to obtain this information. Dr. Morrison, when did you first learn that Bobby Dean sent a text message to the quarter? When we had a meeting in my office. And were there any other incidents that involved Bobby Dean after that meeting? Yes, there were actually in your honor speculation. Six and two. Any my objection? All right, I think what we need is some basis for his understanding of the facts that he's going to be testifying to. So if he did an investigation on his own, who did he talk to? If he had information supplied to him by way of documentary evidence, what information was supplied to him? But just something that tells us where it is that he's obtaining the information that he's going to tell us. Yes, Dr. Morrison, how did you obtain information that other incidents were happening to Bobby Dean on school grounds? Uh, I'm the principal of, of the high school, and when any teachers or the staff psychologists hear of any event on campus of note, including bullying, um, they will come to me with those concerns. Objection, Your Honor, that he's already testified here, say, or is testifying here, say, uh, at this particular time. All right, right now, he's not getting into any comment. He's stated one element of his fund of knowledge. Let's see if there's anything else. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, let's take the time if you move on to. All right. On what day was Vic Porter arrested? October 21st. And did you meet with Vic Porter the day before? On October 20th? Yes. No, I did not. When did you last speak with Vic Porter before he was arrested? I believe that would have been the meeting in my office uh, September 29th. And how did Vic appear when he was in your office at that time? On the 29th or on the 21st? The 29th. Um, he was upset. Um, he told me that, uh, and then this was in the investigation of Dr. Uh, Richards, that uh, his, his word was being uh, slandered, and he had been having inappropriate text messages and rumors spread about him. Objection, Your Honor, here's safe. Response. Uh, Your Honor, these are statements uh, by Vic Borders. Within his personal knowledge, the test by what Vic Borders told him. Uh, is what the quarter told him uh, hearsay. Right? Uh, Your Honor, uh, the quarter uh, court as a, a party opponent in this matter um, is not hearsay. Your Honor, these statements may have been made by a party opponent, but they're not being presented against the interest of that party opponent. Uh, in, in addition, we would object to relevance. All right, I'll, uh, I'll allow the questions. Um, they are. Uh, Statements made by the defendant, and um, I'm satisfied that there is at least some probative value to the statement. So we'll allow the statements, and certainly no uh, unfair prejudice has been established. Yeah. Again, in the sake of time, I'd like to direct your attention to the day Dick Porter was arrested. What happened on that day? On that day, I was notified that a student of mine, uh, Bobby Dean, had attempted to take her own life the night before. Uh, I sent my assistant to call in uh, Vic Porter um, to my office. and My assistant found him in the psychologist's office and brought him to me. And in my office, he was extremely upset. He was crying, and he was very, very sad. Was anybody else present in the office at this time? Yes, Officer Keatley. And what did you observe Officer Keatley do? Uh, Officer Keatley, uh, the... Uh, Vic Porter cell phone from me, read through some text messages, and immediately arrested him. Before Officer Keeley arrested Vic Porter, did you see the officer interview any teachers? No. Did you see the officer interview any parents? No. Did you even see Jackson, the officer? Objection, Your Honor, relevance. Uh, Your Honor, this is relevant as to uh, the, 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 cause, the causality in today's case um, that Vic Porter was arrested for the act of other students and also the procedure of the officer. Um, Scope of the investigation yes, leading to arrest. Your Honor, that 
makes the scope of the investigation uh, makes no part of the, uh, of the, of the statute, the, the cyber rolling statute, any more or less likely. Uh, and in addition, we believe that it's more prejudicial than primitive uh, because it potentially draws uh, the, the questions in the jury's mind about uh, particular procedures in the police department where there's no reason the police department here to combat that today. Uh, and we think that it misdirects the focus from what should be core in today's case, the actual law. It has very little to no appropriate value. All right. In terms of establishing reasonable doubt, the quality of a police investigation is always a relevant fact so long as the questions are directed in an appropriate way. The scope of interviews that were or were not conducted in the court's view is an appropriate line of inquiry. So you may ask the question, the objections are over. Dr. Morrison, before Vic Porter was arrested on October 21st, did you ever see Officer Keeley interview any other students? No. No <coughs> questions. Right. Uh, further questions? May I please work? Yeah. Okay. Principal Morrison, uh, you know Vic Porter's father, isn't that correct? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, in fact, Vic Porter's father is a donor of your school. Uh, yes, he is. He's a rather important donor of your school. Yes, uh, I believe he funds the Habitat for Humanity project. And in addition to funding the Habitat for Humanity project at your school, which is an important program, isn't that correct? Uh, I believe so. He's also the president of the Hawks Booster Club. Objection relevance. Uh, your Honor, this goes directly to the credibility of the witness and the motives for why he is testifying for which I am testifying today. Uh, Your Honor, the fact that the father may be president of the club has no bearing on the issue of the fact that they can make it more or less probable. Right, it may, it may go to bias. Bias is always relevant and will allow the inquiry to be So, Principal Morrison, uh, Mr. Corder is an important donor for your school. He is a donor, yes. And he's in fact the president of the Off Booster Club. Like I said before, yes, he is. Now, Principal Morrison, uh, you said he knew the Corder. And Vic Porter is a leader at school, isn't he? Uh, yes, he is. Kids generally do what he says. I wouldn't have any knowledge about what the kids do. Uh, at, at his direction. But, but Principal, Principal Morrison, uh, he's the captain of the cross team, isn't he? He is. And he is the president of Stevensburg, of, uh, of uh, or he's involved and leads Habitat for Humanity. Yes, yes he does. And in general, He's a leader in your school. I would say that. That carries some weight. Yeah. Now, Principal Morrison, you said that on the day in question, October 20, 2009, the big quarter came into your office. On which day? Uh, I think it was preceding the suicide. It was October 20, 2000, 2009, perhaps the 21st. Sure. Uh, came into your office. No, um, at the behest of my assistant. And when he came into the office, uh, you and your assistant looked at his cell phone, isn't that correct? Yes, we did. You were trying to figure out what's going on? Yes, we were. And you looked at that cell phone, and there were some messages, weren't there? Uh, yes, there were. And those messages were not very nice, were they? Uh, no, they were not. In fact, kind of ugly. Yes, you could classify. Kind of nasty. Yeah. Kind of offensive. Sure. And there wasn't just one message, was it? Uh, no, I believe there were handful, maybe four or five. So there were five messages? Four or uh, five messages. Sure. Four or five messages. And in those four or five messages, they were directed to Bobby Dean, weren't they? They were from Vic Quarter to Bobby Dean. From Vic Quarter to Bobby Dean. So the messages were directed to Bobby Dean. And in those messages, the defendant said some pretty nasty things about Bobby Dean, didn't she? Didn't uh, he? he did. Called her, every, called her a slut. Objection here, sir. Uh, Your Honor, these statements are not being offered for the truth of the matter. In addition, they're statements by party opponents. It's not your say. Response? Uh, Your Honor, we bring your objection that these spec messages were um, obtained in violation of the Fourth Amendment. The defense has not laid any foundation that Principal Morrison sees the cell phone in violation of school policy. All right. I, I think uh, I'm satisfied that the ruling that the court made at the outset in the pretrial motions remains the law of the case. So that objection is a rule. As to the hearsay objection, it does appear to be an admission by a party defendant, so I will allow the question. Objections are ruled. So, Principal Morse, 
On that cell phone, Vic Porter called Bobby Dean a slut, isn't that correct? I believe so. And he also called her a pansy, isn't that correct? I believe so. No further questions. Further questions? Three, three directions. Yes. Dr. Morrison, who <coughs> text messages on your phone? My assistant. And why was that? Uh, I'm not good with cell phones. Where is your first look? You may. I'm showing you what's been previously admitted as a pen exhibit one. The text message transcript obtained from ATM. This text message transcript represents text messages that were sent to Bobby Dean. Can you point to anywhere on that transcript where the five text messages that were referenced in the defense's cross on October 21st or on the alternative, the 20th? Objection, Your Honor, relevance, and specifically 403. Uh, my, particularly where, what I'm getting at is this text, we've seen this particular line of questioning will give the impression that there were no text messages sent. However, in reality, this is a very limited document. So particular particular line of questioning that asks, is it anywhere on this transcript, is not relevant. Also, I guess we can make a 602 objection. Your Honor, in response to the objections, uh, this text transcript is a full and accurate representation of text messages that were came from Bobby Dean's cell phone in relation to the incident in today's case. Um, because the defense brought them up on this cross, would you feel that it's relevant that um, the text messages were sent or they weren't sent? Okay, so in other words, the messages that were referred to on the cross are not on this document. <coughs> and the suggestion is going to be then that their existence might be called into a greater question than those that are in the document produced by the carrier. Yes, Your Honor. And in fact, under 602, we believe that there's been no foundation laid. This is a complete copy of every single text message that was ever sent to Bobby Dean's phone. And this witness can't lay that foundation because he's not the uh, he's not prepared this document. Uh, I'm not even sure if he's seen this document. Before. I'll, I'll allow you to address those matters and recross the objections are before. Yes, sir. Again, Dr. Morrison, can you show us anything from that transcript that Vic Porter sent a message to Bobby Dean on October 20th or 21st? Uh, no, I cannot. No further questions. Recross. Yes, sir. Permission to person. You may. Uh, Principal Morrison, you didn't see. Um, those text messages anywhere on the screen here, did you? Which text message? Uh, text messages that reference Bobby, that reference uh, Bobby Dean as a slut and a pansy. On oh, here? Yes. I see, I see. Okay. I don't see any text messages from the defendant that say that the victim was a slut or a pansy. However, you did see those text messages on Vic Porter's phone, is that correct? I believe so. And they were directed at Bobby Dean? I believe so. And you were positive that you saw those text messages on her phone? Yes. No further questions. Anything further? No, you won't. Thank you. Any further evidence on behalf of the defendant? No, you're on the defense. Your Honor, at this time, the state would like to, well, first we would like to have a conference to examine the uh, admissibility of, I uh, believe what's been labeled prosecutions A, we would like to publish that to the jury. We have prepared a redacted version, uh, if, if you would, uh, if we could approach the bench and the counsel. Let the record reflect, I am approaching the opposing counsel uh, with a redacted version of state's A. Commissioner Birch. All right, thank you. Is the does the redacted version cure the hearsay concerns? It does, Your Honor. All right. And is the state uh, agreeable that the redacted version would go in, or do you want rulings on the unredacted version? Your Honor, we would like a ruling on the unredacted version. However, we are prepared to proceed with this particular document if our uh, previous contention that the, uh, I guess, to rephrase that, we do make, we contend that State 6 of 8 in its entirety should be admissible, that there is no hearsay, that these are statements by a party opponent, that these are not being offered for the truth of the matter, that these statements have been adopted by uh, 
submit the defendant. However, if our objection is overruled and we would like the ruling on that, we would be prepared to submit a redacted version. All right. And we can assume that we've had a 15-minute conference where much blood was let on the <laughs> of Exhibit A as proposed, and you can assume that I have granted the request that certain hearsay matters be redacted from the document. But you have made a well-founded presentation to preserve your point, but I don't think we want to have that discussion going through each point. Yes, Your Honor. So uh, we'll, permission to publish? Yes. We'll produce or uh, receive approach. States A as States 1. Permission to approach. You may uh, approach. To approach the jury. You may publish to the jury. Uh, and at this time, uh, Your Honor, the State would like to request a brief recess, five or ten minutes, to prepare for closing arguments. All right. Members of the jury, you're looking at a redacted document. You should not speculate as to what is in the redactions or why it was redacted. That was a ruling the court made as a matter of law. So please don't speculate as to why those redactions are there or what might have been redacted. And you want a conference to address uh, jury instructions? So, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, sure. yes, Your Honor. Uh, the recess, we, I mean. Right. We would request uh, a permission to recess to prepare for closings. Oh, uh, very well. We'll recess five minutes. Uh, uh, yes, Your Honor. Five minutes. Let's take the jury out.
for the jury? You may be seated. Are we ready for the jury? I guess the answer is yes. testified there were text messages from the defendant 
They call it fogging in a slut and a fancy. So when we look at is the defendant a scapegoat, the defense's own case contradicts itself. Well, let's look at what the prosecution, what the state is supposed to prove at today's trial. Now, as my co-counsel, Christy Montroy, told you at the beginning of today's trial, our burden is beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's not an insurmountable burden. It's a burden that's met in courtrooms every day across America. And it's a burden that we have met today. And we've met it in regards to four points that you see up on the screen before you today. The four points of the felony harassment charge that we're bringing against the defendant. Number one, the defendant knowingly intimidated, frightened, or caused emotional distress to another person. That the defendant used an electronic communication to aid in that harassment. That the defendant was over the age of 18 at the time of the harassment. And that the person who was harassed, the victim, Bobby Dean, was 17 years old or younger. Now, let's examine each one of these points that the state has attempted to prove to you today. First, that the defendant knowingly intended to cause emotional distress, uh, fright, or intimidation to the defendant. And this is going to be broken down into two points, and I'm sure the defense will tell you when they're closing. One, we have to show that it was knowing, and secondly, we have to show there was actual this, actually the state produced in Bobby Dean. Now, Bobby's own testimony is, speaks, I think, totally sufficiently to the emotional distress that she's undergone. I've heard about how her life at school was never the same. The more difficult question is, was this knowing? And I'm sure that's what the defense will harp on. I think there are three things you should bear in mind. First, that the defendant had a motive. As we heard in the testimony from Bobby Dean and from the defendant and from Ari, the motive was to get his girlfriend back. Secondly, we have a statement from the defendant himself on the bookface page that's before you today that you can bring back to the jury room to look at, where he says, no one likes this lot. I'm going to make sure that Bobby Dean never forgets to respect elders again. That is a statement of intent. And it says exactly what the defendant intended. And the third thing that you should consider are the threats that the defendant uh, made against Bobby. What is the purpose of a threat? You don't wish somebody happy birthday with a threat. You don't wish, you don't congratulate them with a threat. The very purpose of a threat is to intimidate. The existence of threats demonstrates intimidation. And then you have Ari's own testimony about exactly what happened, what him and Vic were up to, and that, again, illustrates that it was known. So on this particular point of the law, the state prevails. Now, on the second point, that the defendant used electronic communication to aid in the rest. Well, we see the bookface page brought in by the state. We see the electronic text messages brought in by the principal. So this has been met. So at this point in the analysis, we have the state two, defense zero. Third point really hasn't been contested. And that's that at the time of the rest of the defendant was 18 to 18. We heard that in cross, we heard that in direct. It's not in, it's not in contest today. That point has been met. State three, defense zero. And finally, that the victim was 17 years of age or younger at the time of harassment. We heard that directly from Bobby Dean herself. This point has also been illustrated. So the score is state four, defense zero. And I remind you that if the state scores four, the defense's case goes straight out the door. And that's exactly what has occurred today. Now, choices have consequences. Bobby Dean and her family have already felt those consequences. And you know, it's time for the defendant to step up and accept responsibility for his choices. It's time to send a message that preying on those who are weaker and less powerful than you is simply unacceptable. And that starts, based on all the evidence, by returning a verdict of guilty, guilty on felony harassment for the defendant. Defense may address the jury in closing arguments. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard two stories today. And I'm not talking about the prosecution's case versus the defense's case. I'm talking about two stories about two separate <coughs> events. The first is a fight over a girl between Bobby Dean and Vic Quarter. And in that fight, both were active participants. Each one gave as good as they got. The second story is a much more tragic story, a much sadder story. But it also has a different cast. The second story involves other students at Midlands High School who harassed Bobby D, causing Bobby D emotional distress. Vic Corder was not one of those students. 
the government wants you to think that these two stories are one and the same. The government wants you to think that Vic Porter is responsible for the actions of all the other students at Midlands High School. But the evidence does not support this. You heard Vic Porter testify that he did not know other students were going to prank Bobby Dean. He did not know that other students were going to send harassing text messages and emails. Vic Porter didn't ask these students to do these things. He didn't encourage those students to do those things. In fact, you heard testimony from Vic Porter and Ari Narani, the government's own witness, that when Vic Porter found out that some of his teammates and friends had harassed Bobby Dean by vandalizing his locker, he punched them by making them run laps. <clears throat> Vic Porter and Ari Narani also testified the Vic asked his friends, including Ari, to stop posting on Bookface. Vic Quarter is not responsible for the actions of those third parties. Vic Quarter is responsible for his own actions. However, in order for you to find those actions criminal, <coughs> the prosecution must prove four things beyond a reasonable doubt. The government has so kindly demonstrated them up on the board. One, the government must show that Vic Quarter was 18 years old or older at the time in question. This is not in dispute. Vic Quarter was 18 at the time. Two, the government must show that Bobby Dean was 17 years old or younger at the time in question. This is not in dispute. Bobby Dean was 15 at the time. Three, the government must show that Vic Quarter used electronic communications. This is not in dispute. Vic Quarter admitted on the stand that he created a book face group. He also admitted that he sent Bobby Dean some text messages. What is in dispute is the fourth part of the law. The government must